Hi, thank you for joining us today for an important panel discussion on addressing the opportunities and challenges of preventing diabetes related amputations. I'm Lisa Murdoch, the Chief Advocacy Officer for the American Diabetes Association, and I want to extend a warm welcome to all of you joining us and to our panelists today. Over the next hour, our esteemed panelists will be discussing what's driving the rise in rates of amputations, the role of the healthcare team in foot care, how health systems can better address gaps in care that contribute to these amputations, treatment guidelines, and what clinicians need to know to better treat their patients with diabetes, and much, much more. Before I introduce our panelists, let's have a brief level set with numbers that may be very familiar to some of you, but a surprise to others. Every three minutes in the United States, a limb is amputated due to diabetes. More than 150,000 to 54,000 diabetes-related amputations take place every year in the U.S. The rates of amputations have increased 75% over the last decade, and as many as 85% of those amputations are avoidable. It's not a, probably a surprise to you that rates of amputations are significantly higher in minority communities. Black Americans, for instance, are four times more likely to have an amputation than non-Hispanic white Americans. The same holds true for increased rates of amputations amongst Latinx communities, indigenous communities, um, who all suffer higher rates of amputations. In September, it's in September, the American Diabetes Association launched the Amputation Prevention Alliance. The alliance is focused on saving limbs and lives, including in those communities facing disproportionately high rates of amputations and related mortality. The alliance has begun work to advance needed policy changes and drive clinician awareness of opportunities to prevent amputations and empower people with diabetes to advocate for their best care. Recently, the Alliance developed guiding policy principles, which include ensuring people with diabetes have access um, to evidence-supported medical tools, technologies, and services they would need to prevent avoidable amputations, ensuring patients have access to quality care that considers amputations as a, law, as a last resort and not a first option, and underscoring that preventing amputations requires a team-based collaborative approach. Collaborating here with me today are our three wonderful panelists. Let me introduce them. Dr. David Armstrong holds a Master's of Science in Tissue Repair and Wound Healing from the University of Wales College of Medicine and a PhD from the University of Manchester College of Medicine. He is currently a professor of surgery at the University of Southern California and is the founder and director of the Southwestern Academic Limb Salvage Alliance. Dr. Armstrong has produced more than 540 peer-reviewed research papers in dozens of scholarly, med scholarly medical journals, as well as over 100 books or book chapters. He is the co-editor of ADA's Clinical Care of the Diabetic Foot, now entering its fourth edition. Dr. Armstrong was selected as one of the first six international wound care ambassadors and is a re the recipient of numerous awards and degrees by universities and international medical organizations, including the inaugural Georgetown Distinguished Award for Diabetic Limb Salvage. He is the founder and co-chair of the International Diabetic Foot Conference, the largest annual symposium on diabetic feet in the world. He is also the founding president of the American Limb Preservation Society, a medical and surgical society dedicated to building interdisciplinary teams to eliminate preventable amputation in the US and worldwide. Also joining us is Dr. Richard Neville. Um, he is the director of the of Innova Vascular, associate director of the Innova Heart and Vascular Institute and vice chairman of the Department of Surgery at Innova. Dr. Neville joined the Innova Medical Group with more than 25 years of clinical experience. He has consistently been named to the best doctors of America and Washingtonian, Washingtonian top docs. His clinical interests include lower extremity revascularization and wound healing, amputation prevention, cartoid artery treatment for stroke prevention, as well as hemodialysis access. Most recently, Dr. Neville served as the professor of the of, in the Department of Surgery and as the Ludwig Chief of Vascular Surgery at Georgetown, Was George Washington University, excuse me. Prior to that position, he was the Chief of Vascular Surgery at Georgetown University. 
And lastly, I will introduce, um, it's my really uh, pleasure to introduce Rodica Papasui. Dr. Papasui is the Larry D. Soderquist Professor of Diabetes, a prominent diabetologist at Michigan Medicine and the, rec and the recognized leader in the field of diabetes and diabetes complications. She is the Vice Chair of for Clinical Research in the Department of the Inter Internal Medicine and the Associate Director of Clinical Research, Mentoring and Development of the Elizabeth Caswell Diabetes Institute at the University of Michigan. She is the president-elect for medicine and science for the American Diabetes Association, and her interests include um, chronic complications of diabetes, particularly diabetic, diabetic perif peripheral and cardiovascular autonomic neuropathy, as well as diabetic foot complications, diabetic kidney disease, and diabetic cardiovascular disease, and the design and conduct of traditional and pragmatic clinical trials for patients with diabetes. Dr. Papasui has published more than 200 peer-reviewed manuscripts and book chapters and received awards from the American Diabetes Association and the University of Michigan. She chaired the American Diabetes Association position statement on diabetic neuropathy and has chaired the, uh, is the chair of the ADA's Diabetes and Cardiovascular Disease Interest Group. Most recently, she has been elected to the chair, to, to a two chair, excuse me, the Precision Prognostic and Type 1 Diabetes Working Group of the American Diabetes Association, European Association for the Study of Diabetes. We have, as you can see, we have an excellent and esteemed group of panelists. I can't wait to dive into some of these questions. Just um, as a reminder for those of you joining us today, you are welcome to post questions for our panelists in the comment section. We'll try to get to as many as possible. So with that, let's just dive right in. Earlier, By the way, can I, can I just say, holy cow, after intros <laughs> like that, you can only be freaking disappointed. So everyone <laughs> just buckle up for the disappointment. At least in my am, case, not in Rodica or Ritz's case. I'm just going to say that right I, now. I am confident that no one will be disappointed, Dr. Armstrong, but I appreciate the levity. Um, so earlier I mentioned um, that amputations are on the rise, and this is despite medical advances that have occurred. And, and I'm, I'm wondering if we can kick this, co this conversation off with why that's happening. And, and so I'll open that up to one of you to jump in. Well, I'll start out, Lisa, and you know, I'll start out by saying I'm just so proud to be a part of this this broadcast and on the panel with these esteemed colleagues, and and and, and this alliance. This alliance is so important. You know, David and Rodika and I, we've been doing this a long time. I know David and I have. We've been working together a long time. We've been doing this for twenty something years, and just don't seem to move the needle significantly. You know, and I don't know if that's because diabetes is significantly on the rise. Awareness is not what it should be. Access to care is not what it should be. But we just we are, we are just with with all that we've developed, all the techniques which we can talk about later, wound care, revascularization, diagnosis. We just haven't moved the needle like we should. So I'm hoping that alliances like this are so critical uh, to address issues we need to address to take advantage of what we've done to, to move the needle forward. I would like also to, first of all, acknowledge this very important program, Lisa, and uh, acknowledge overall the American Diabetes Association initiative uh, in creating this alliance, uh, as well as in partnering with various organizations that are critical to actually move the needle uh, in the right direction. Um, Again, thank you so much. It's it's a truly a, an honor to be here today um, with dear friends like David um, and a more recent friends like Richard. I think that we all understand that uh, only working together uh, we can uh, truly make a difference. And you know, answering your initial question is that that it's true. There is no question that the number of people with diabetes is unfortunately still increasing at unacceptable high rates. And there is a, a possible link um, in the number of amputation with, with that. But as we have also observed and um, being able to um, note from, from the literature as well, which looks uh, critically at various um, way in which our own 
standard of clinical cares are being implemented, we were able to um, witness that there is a huge heterogeneity in how these standards of cares that the American Diabetes Association, the Vascular um, Society for Diabetic Food Complications are updating um, is are being actually used. So thus, we still have a, a very, um, you know, important work to continue to do. And uh, not only to educate providers, but to truly implement a team approach in the care of all people with diabetes and diabetic food complications. And I like to say that this can be done. I think that our example at University of Michigan is a, a very clear one in which by partnering with the key providers between the diabetologists, primary care physicians, and podiatrists that are embedded in the clinics where people with diabetes are receiving their clinical care, has been an instrumental step that actually led to a very important reduction in the number of amputations. We have done an analysis um, uh, that we had that opportunity by um, critically reviewing the numbers of amputations in our health system preceding having our podiatry colleagues present with us in clinic. And we took a similar period of years after the fully implementation of podiatry and our inpatient service and diabetes limb preservation programs have happened. And we have been able to demonstrate more than 60% reduction in our health system of major amputation. And I think that that's another key aspect that I would like to hear, David and Richard opinion. You know, sometimes minor amputations may be on the rise, but they do not have the same uh, you know, impact on patient prognosis and patient life as the major amputation. And if we can reduce the major amputation, we, I think, can um, um, say that we are victorious. Yeah, Radhika, I think that is, I mean, there's so much to unpack here, Lisa, with, with every, uh, but, and, uh, you know, we could just go on uh, forever on any one of the streams that have been described. But let's first talk about one of the things that Radhika just said, which is heterogeneity. Um, and not just in adoption of, of, of guidance or guidelines or documents, but really just in care um, right now in the United States. And by the way, let me say that the U.S. Um, is not alone in this. Uh, um, these data are similar around the world. But um, if we look at the United States now, there is a uh, there is about a tenfold variation um, in amputation, uh, depending on your metropolitan statistical area. It's a, it's a zip code lottery um, around the United States. Um, but so, so that would tell you that there's probably some top down issues uh, in terms of getting resources to certain areas uh, that uh, like the diabetes belt, uh, you know, in, in the uh, in the U.S., um, like in places that are sort of medical deserts, if you will, food deserts, et cetera, uh, which has been you know, uh, an important part of, of care for the longest time. There's that sort of top down bit. But then there's also the bottom up bit. If you drill down into individual cities, um, I'll give you an example here in Los Angeles. We have uh, uh, give or take 10.1 million people in um, in the greater Los Angeles area in uh, in L.A. County, uh, massively, uh, you know, enormously uh, diverse and rich uh, group of people, both ethnically, socioeconomically, just in terms of everything. And uh, if you look at our zip code lottery, it's again, tenfold, depending on if you live uh, in Malibu or if you live in South Central. Uh, and, but if we drill down into individual hospitals in those individual zip codes, and I'm sorry to get on into all this inside baseball, but it matters, let me just explain. If you zip, drill down into there, which we have and others have as well, what you start to find is wild. It's that sometimes there's like a five-fold, six-fold difference in, uh, Rodika said this, talked about the high to low amputation ratio. We will look at the limb sparing amputations that are done in the foot, which are have a very different outcome from the above, the below the knee and above the knee amputations. Uh, uh, so there could be a five or six-fold difference in 
two different hospitals in the same zip code within just a couple of blocks of each other, same catchment area. So what does that tell you? What that tells you is that individual women and men in those individual hospitals can make a difference. And that, and so this is an enormously exciting time because you can win and this, this uh, collaboration now with the Alliance can win on the top down policy bit, but also on the bottom up uh, a, a, a bit, which is, and both I think are, are just dramatically needed now uh, in the United States and around the world today. Yeah, and, and Lisa, let me just pick up on what both of my esteemed colleagues said. You know, to start off with what, what Rudika, she's at the University of Michigan, and it sounds like they have an amazing program that's making a huge difference. But to David's point, you just heard, because, you know, I've done this now at Georgetown, I've done it at George Washington, and now I've done it in the Innova system. And I go around, as David does, we go around talking to places about how to do this. So the first time I gave this talk, how do you do this? Well, it's a multidisciplinary team. And I had these slides of all the things you needed to set up one of these centers to stop amputation. You know what I say now? I start off by saying, look, all politics is local. It's different in every place. It was different at Georgetown than it was at GW, than it is in Inova. I'm sure than it is at Michigan. I'm jealous of the program Rudy gets. And I know David has an amazing program. So my message to people is well, sort of what David said, just get started. Get somebody that's passionate about doing it. I would say that you'd need a vascular person and a soft tissue person and a diabetologist. Those are your really key components. But that can be a variety of people. I mean, we've got world-class ways to revascularize legs. We're on the cutting edge of getting blood into your leg. But if I don't have the other pieces, if I don't have an arm strong, what am I going to do? So I think you just get started by finding people in your health system that are passionate about this. And I, again, I think you need somebody that can get blood into the leg and somebody that can put the tissue back together and then somebody that can manage the diabetes. And that can be different in each location, hospital to hospital, as David just mentioned. Yeah, I cannot agree more, Richard. And thank you so much for bringing that up. And I think that perhaps that's another area where we can make a difference. Right together with the resources of the American Diabetes Association, all these uh, limb preservation um, uh, alliance and the societies that you and, and David are being part of because providing people the tools that could be used and being adapted at each local environment, it's, it's key. I completely agree with you as well that vascular surgeons uh, are part of the teams. They are part of the team here at Michigan. But at the end of the day, what we need to make happen is to make it easiest for a patient who does have a foot complication to be having access to that complex treatment in one shop. Because if given you know the complexity of our health system if a diabetologist or a primary care physician who identifies a foot ulcer in one of their patients does not have the infrastructure in place to immediately you know offer that service to that particular patient and they have to be sent to various places and wait for months to be seen well i mean that's another reason of why this initially less complex you know wound lesions are then advancing, are getting infected, and, and so on and so forth. Uh, so that is something that uh, we have started to put together, I think, through guidelines. But I think that we have more work to do through educational component. And again, giving people access to the variety of modalities that can be used, again, capitalizing also on the local conditions. Yeah, so you just mentioned guidelines and recently ADA released their 2023 standards of care um, in diabetes and updated its, guide, its guidance on neuropathy and foot care. How do we work within the healthcare system and, and with providers to increase the uptake and implementation of the recommendations? It's great that we have the recommendations. How do we get people to utilize them and what are the biggest barriers for health systems and providers in doing that? Well, I can start speaking. So Lisa, we just went through this. So as chairman of surgery, we just went through this in the department of surgery, trying to come up with standard guidelines, not just for diabetic foot care, but just for some of the things that we do. And the goal is to standardize care in the system, eliminate variation. So if you come to one of our hospitals, you're going to be treated similarly to if you come to the other one. 
And that increases awesome. quality and reduces cost. In terms of implementing the guidelines, I tell you, it's it's tougher than you think. I, I, you know, so I think oh, you have to raise awareness. You have to tell people we have guidelines. We're going to follow these. It, it's hard to tell people how they have to practice in every clinical situation. But we've used the guidelines to say this is how, and that's what we'll do with the diabetic foot guidelines. This is how we're going to approach things. And if you deviate markedly from that, that's going to probably have some repercussions. Hey, Rodica, I, I, would you I agree. Um, yeah. Yeah. Could, okay. could you speak to, I'm sorry to, I, I know you're already talking, but let me, let me uh, through the chair direct that Richard's great question. You, you and I have spoken about this as, you know, late as just a couple of weeks ago about some of the um, uh, uh, issues that you've had, not only with guidelines, but then implementing them in electronic medical records. Can, yeah. can you speak to that? Yeah, absolutely. And uh, I would like also to, to thank Richard for making that comment. It's absolutely true. We do have guidelines. Thank and you, Richard, for making that comment. Are, are very, very good. But why there is such a, um, you know, such a var variability in, in guidelines being implemented uh, and why is it so complicated? And, and perhaps we do not know all the answer on why. Uh, and uh, I think there is also a, a large variability in how guidelines and standard of care are being adhered to uh, when you compare an academic institution like the ones that we are lucky to be part of, uh, as well as, you know, various other places in uh, rural areas. Uh, so um, so that's, that's one point that we need to work on. Uh, Another resource that I like to highlight here exactly to try to understand more in depth the whys is the recently funded uh, NIDDK Diabetic Food Consortium mm -hmm. that uh, has um, finished its initial cycle. And in our next cycle of, of this consortium, we have identified exactly this as one of the priority and trying to understand why the standard of care for diabetic food complication and ulcers are, are not being followed uniformly and actually are not being followed by a pretty large majority of providers. And it's not only providers, but it's also why patients do not adhere to some of the recommendations that are in line with the standards of care. Uh, so that's something that we are uh, obviously aware and trying to understand more in depth. Um, and then I think that another way of improving, um, you know, the impact is indeed, as David mentioned, capitalizing on resources that were not available, let's say, 10, 15 years ago, because each of these health systems like yours, Richard, has their internal, you know, quality improvement committees that are establishing guidelines for many other conditions, whether they are chronic, whether they are surgical procedures, right? So we are trying, of course, to promote that this uh, well-established, um, based on evidence, standards of care are also being implemented through health system. And that can now be done since we do have electronic medical records that could prompt at least the critical components, right? So, and in our case for, for diabetic foot complications, you are obviously the experts that we all know that if we can promote offloading and local debridement, right, for instance, and, you know, good assessment of the vascular supply, those would be very important points that could then help in, you know, preventing uh, more uh, serious complications that will lead to amputations. Right. Others want to chime in? Oh, we've okay. chimed. Okay. <laughs> well, thank you. I'm happy to chime some more if you like. <laughs> you can chime I want to chime in this time of year too. Yeah, absolutely. So I think we've all we've talked about the the, the need for this to be a full team approach, right? Um, in in terms of all the the pieces of the day of the healthcare team. What is the role when if we look at breaking this down? What is the role of the full healthcare team in preventing amputations, and where do you see the biggest gaps? Um, let me get started. Um, I'll, I'll just talk about, we've sort of, just like with Radhika, just like with Rich, uh, you know, having um, f f failed and succeeded quite a lot, sometimes at the same time, <laughs> in different, different places over many, many years, we sort of have boiled this down, if you will, to sort of, we call it four steps. I know you're supposed to do it in threes, 
especially this time of year, right? Uh, but uh, we're gonna we'll do it in in a four four steps to success, and you start with the most acute problem. And you can be agnostic to team, although clearly there are a lot of data to show that podiatry, vascular, diabetology, primary care, uh, good quality you know, physical therapy, or if you're British, physiotherapy can help. Let's be agnostic about our own individual uh, specialties. And let's just talk about how to do it, how to do it and how to measure it. First is you, the most acute to the, to the largest kind of screening concept regionally or nationally. First problem is in your own hospital or your even an emergency department. And we call uh, uh, setting up something like that, your team, uh, we call it a tow and flow team in our unit, but we call, you need to have a one number that women and men can call 24 seven there if they're on the wards or if they're, or they're in the ED. And we call that uh, um, hotline. We don't call it a foot hotline. We call it a hot foot line. And that's, just something that people can call and it's usually a text nowadays or however you want to get bleeped or beeped. Um, and then the team can descend on that extremity. And it's often not at the same time anymore, especially the peri pandemic, but often it is if you can do it. And the way to measure outcomes there, of course, is high level amputation, high to low amputation ratio, length of stay, things of that nature. Then the patient is discharged once the flow problem has been addressed, once the toe problem, meaning the infection has been addressed. They're usually discharged to a tissue loss clinic, a wound clinic. Um, and then the goal there in that wound clinic uh, is, uh, and you can have different staff there uh, to try to get that wound healed as quickly as possible. Um, and, and those are your measurements of success. Uh, and uh, you can have specific resources uh, uh, there. But once someone is healed, they're not healed. Recurrence is very common in this population. You know that 40% will recur at one year, two thirds at three, three quarters at five with the best available data we have. So these patients are not healed, they're in remission. So we then, uh, our goal is to extend ulcer-free days, hospital-free days, activity-rich days in people in remission in what we call remission clinics, which are often just you know, podiatry clinics. Uh, which have some other plussed up aspects of them. Uh, and that uh, can be modified around the country or around the world. And then the final bit, and I'm sorry, and I'm going to shut up after this because I've been chiming on too long. Uh, the, I am not like Gun King Wetzelis, who I'm sure uh, who was uh, in Prague was much more kind of succinct. I'm the opposite. Uh, but uh, he, here we go. The fourth bit is setting up after you've done your first three is the screening program. And that screening program can be done with a, what we call a, a three minute, which has even been boiled down to one minute foot exam, which is based on the American Diabetes Association's uh, clinical care of the diabetic foot and our comprehensive uh, exam or our uh, diabetic foot exam that we put together many years ago. Uh, um, and, uh, and so that can then put people into those other clinics or it just into a clinic where they are being followed once every year or even sometimes every couple of years. That has been adopted now, I'm happy to say, by places not only around the country here, but even in parts of the National Health Service in the UK and across uh, those areas. And you start to see big differences because you're measuring what you manage when you put these things together writ large and writ small. Um, and it's very, very exciting to see these data because you can see where you're failing and where you're succeeding. Right. I agree completely, um, uh, David, uh, with everything you said. I think that those are very important pointers. The other thing is, you know, reflecting on our initial conversation and how we can enable, you know, the uh, um, adherence. I think that the adherence, again, should be two ways, providers and patients. For providers, um, capitalizing on just, uh, you know, submitting a quick best practice through the EMR that any patient with diabetes, once it's being seen, whether it's PCP and or, or another, you know, specialist should have their uh, shoes and socks removed. Um, we have done that at Michigan. Um, I know that other, other health systems are doing that. But this is, you know, the first initial key step to increase awareness of providers that um, underneath those shoes uh, something uh, more severe can happen and that thing can be prevented by just learning that it exists. And, and that's that is it? Go ahead. Go ahead. No, and that's relatively easy to do regardless of, of the location, whether it's academic, whether it's rural, and, and it, it's, it's really important. Um, 
also think that we need to capitalize on the fact that there are clear differences uh, in the socioeconomic situation of patients who are more likely to develop these complications, starting with diabetic foot ulcers. And therefore, we should have a system in place that more support is available. We know now how to target, actually. We've learned a lot from all this evidence that David and Richard have mentioned. So we could create a system in targeting people who are at highest risk of having diabetic complication, foot complications and you know, proactively reaching out. Um, there are ways also in which patients can upload their own pictures into photos, into the medical records of their feet. And our team also at Michigan, and I really have to uh, acknowledge my amazing colleagues, uh, Dr. Brian Schmidt and Crystal Holmes, who are leading the podiatry team at Michigan, who have um, devised, um, you know, a scoring algorithm on the risk based on various comorbidities, socioeconomic status, as well as the aspect of the feet that can, in a way, bypass, of course, this overflowed, we specialists, providers, everybody who provides care to diabetes are, of course, outnumbered. But there are ways in leveraging resources so people can have uh, a more rapid access to care if they are in the highest category of risk. Yeah, and then Lisa, the only thing I'd add on those amazing comments by my two colleagues is, is just, you know, as I said, you, you need providers that are passionate about this. And it's going to be a little different in Michigan or in Los Angeles. But two pieces we sometimes forget, just to add on, two pieces that you need to think about that eventually need to be added. First of all, I would ar argue that you need some kind of a navigator, some kind of someone's going to navigate people through the system, especially if you don't have a nice center like Dr. Armstrong does or at Michigan where people can come, you know, and we've had that at other my other locations. Here we are sort of, we have all the pieces and we have to put them together and make it easy access for people and a good nurse or, or APP navigator has been crucial to patient satisfaction and access. And then the second thing, and I, I, I'm not a fan of this term, but I, I'm starting to, to learn it and like it, is marketing. And when I say marketing, I mean awareness. So we, you've got to tell people that you can do this and we've got to get people to the right places. We've got to get people to Michigan. We've got to get people to Los Angeles. And that, that's awareness of the providers we have people in our own area that don't know what we can do. That's patient awareness. Patients have to realize that if they're told you need a big amputation, that they should think, well, maybe I can go somewhere and they need to know where to go. So I think there's provider awareness, there's patient awareness. And then the final thing is so germane to this alliance is, is health policy awareness. Yes. I mean, unfortunately on I live near Capitol Hill. <laughs> and let me tell you, those guys are in a bubble. <laughs> guys and girls, <laughs> people, <laughs> they're in a bubble. So they, and this, you know, if you have a heart attack, you run to the emergency room, you know where to go. If you've got a stroke, you know to go to a stroke center. We are a little behind the curve on this. And I think that's, that's why I'm so excited about working with my colleagues in an alliance like this, because I think there's a huge amount we can do with health policy awareness too. So patients, providers, and health policy. And I hate to call it marketing, but it's it's just a, kind of a marketing awareness to take advantage Rich, of I know, it, I, I know it sounds crass and I, I don't like it either, that whole transactional kind of concept with all that, but sometimes you feel like you have to take a shower when you're thinking about those kinds of things. But yeah, well, I, I do well, believe yeah, I that. Up one quick, uh, you know, I'm just getting tired. I'm getting very, very tired of people showing up in my email, ER with a gangrenous foot and I can't do anything and except take it off. And I'm like, where you been? <laughs> you know, where have you been? You're, are you sitting at home? Is somebody not taking your shoe off? Where have you been? Uh, it's happening right now. I'm just going to tell you right now, it's happening right now on a on a separate on my left of my screen here on a separate uh, thread here on a on a text thread uh, uh, about a patient that's showing up in one of our hospitals um, having never and, and not through any fault of any like yeah. evil doctor or something no or evil nurse or or some bad system that just it doesn't like people. It's just there. This person was bounced around like a pachinko that's right. ball and they're ending up now in the little, in the receiving bowl in our emergency department. And I'm, I'm looking at it and it's, and it's exactly as you're describing, Rich, it's, it's friggin' terrible. Uh, this patient has a, a necrotizing infection and, and yeah. literally as we speak, and, and it's not 
the, the fault is, is created is, is not having this thing take on as much importance as it can as other things. Cause this, no matter what anyone says, no one cares about it outside of this webinar. Unfortunately, no one cares or not enough because it's quiet. We're, we're really good at managing things that are loud bombs, bullets, yeah. right? IEDs. Yeah. Um, but we're not good at things that are, 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 are you know, trauma we're good at, quiet, yeah. silent, sinister well, syndromes. You know, I'm really hoping we're, this we're alliance not can make that case, David, because, you know, we could certainly make the case to Capitol Hill that there's a financial and an economic health system <laughs> aspect to this. I mean, that patient Rich, that you have in your ER, David, is going to cost the health system a lot more money. I can I can give you a, we just we just published on. over the weekend how much that's going to cost uh, yeah. minimum right and uh, uh, but but the fact uh, but uh, and and then for that for this for this person uh, coming in uh, right uh, in in this case uh, uh, his uh, uh, you know uh, five year mortality is going to be yeah. worse than all but the worst cancers and he's uh, not gonna again he's going to have hard employment a burden to his family there's all kinds of economic considerations. Yeah, the trouble, I completely course. agree. We we do have a lot of work to do to, yeah. um, you know, uh, lobbying policies, changing and access to the right type of care sure. for, for these patients. Because unfortunately, you know, and I have to say that uh, at Michigan too, you know, 15 years ago when, uh, when we started this, it was not easy. I think that there are a, a lot of other considerations from a financial perspective, I mean, immediate financial perspective on uh, some procedures versus others that need to be eliminated because as David has shown and, and you have shown, uh, in fact, the costs, eventually the cost to society, the, the cost to the entire healthcare uh, and most importantly, the cost in human lives are um, too high. We need to change the status quo. We are in the right direction. The evidence is there to support us, but we don't have yet. We are not backed up by very strong policies that enable actually the, um, you know, the use and the implementation of these guidelines and standard of care uh, broadly uh, across the entire country. And it's not only you know, the abridgment of ulcers. Recently, um, we have been uh, in this um, great conference that, that David has mentioned and just looking at how people, for instance, based on their race and zip code have even access to revascularization procedures or even being offer revascularization process. If you happen to live in an arbor, yes, per evidence or, you know, in Los Angeles. But if you happen to live in Mississippi, you are not even being discussed uh, that you should, you know, that you are a candidate to a revascularization procedure. And that that's a huge problem. So anyway. Yeah, just this um, is, this is, uh, I'm sorry, Lisa, I, but I would no. just to conclude here. This is, you know, this is serious as a heart attack, right? And uh, but it's not taken as seriously as a heart attack because it's quiet, right? You're not oh, falling down or like with a stroke or things of this nature, but this is a foot attack. And uh, yeah. the trouble is it happens often very, very slowly until it doesn't. And then people blame the other problems, not the system of care that could have improved uh, care here. I'm sorry. Lisa, for delaying there. Oh, you know, absolutely, and I and I like foot attack. That's that's great. We may have to we may have to use that for our. Well, you can you can take that from parts of the National Health Service. My friends of mine as well who developed something called fast track to avoid a foot attack. Ah, uh, and, all right. Uh, and so you, I am happy to put you. Uh, 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 yeah, this is that very very real. We could talk about all those things later. FYI, there there are so many great comments. Have you, I don't know if you've seen great there. Great comments, from, uh, yeah. We we're being enthusiastic as well from around the world. Yeah, we've been joined by yeah, joined by people from around the world. I've seen um, comments from Turkey. We've seen comments from Kenya and South Africa. So I'm. It's you're really. Um, I'm just really energized by the audience today. A um, couple of the questions that I wanted to to just pull up and throw to you from the from the comment section is is. First of all, what 
did the pandemic do to further the prognosis of diabetic foot problems? Did you see an increase because there was a gap in, in not seeing patients in person? How does telehealth work with that? What, you know, what was your experience in, with the pandemic over the last several years? Yeah, so we actually wrote an abstract on that, Lisa. We're in the process of publishing. So we looked at the amputation rates across our system pre-COVID and aged and did some prospective uh, patient cohort matching with patients during uh, COVID. And it was fascinating. And there's been many publications uh, on this, but our particular experience, um, and we we triaged our patients and came up with a, a tier system so that we would see patients who were acutely in trouble, but again, not like we used to do. So what did we see? Well, what we found was the amputation rate did not go up. So the amputation rate across the system did not go up, but it was skewed much more to, ma to major amputations. So we had many more BK and AK above the ankle amputations, okay. though the total number of amputations didn't go up because of delays in care, people not coming in until they absolutely had to. So we didn't see any increase in amputations, but we saw many more, a, a higher percentage of above ankle amputations. So I think COVID definitely did have uh, an impact. Now we did get into telemedicine. We got into it in a big way. We have backed off on that a little bit for, in the vascular world because I still like touching and feeling and feeling the pulse. <laughs> and it's hard to do that with telemedicine. But we certainly do offer telemedicine in the appropriate situations. But we're trying to get people to come back in for the people that we see uh, in large measure. And uh, yeah, I agree. I would have to say that in our experience was the same. Um, there was a, an, a lack of access initially, particularly in the first six, seven months of the pandemic. And that actually had uh, prompted us, again, our team of podiatrists to very rapidly develop the best algorithm in screening and triaging people that truly needed to be seen in clinic immediately uh, because the access was very much reduced. Uh, as similar with Richard, um, um, we have noticed that uh, by doing this triage, we actually could be effective and our number of amputation for our health system did, did not increase either. But I think that unlike Richard, we did not, um, um, with not, we did not increase the major amputation because this team was able to actually screen and triage, you know, thousands of, of patients very rapidly with the algorithm that they put together. Again, this has been published as well. Um, uh, last year, um, 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 this uh, algorithm that uh, the podiatry team at the University of Michigan had developed. The other aspect is also that people who had ulcers also seem to have obviously higher risk of more severe uh, COVID uh, complication as well. I mean, obviously there is a vicious cycle through this inflammation and, and um, changes due to uh, the infection that had um, um, had translated in uh, more uh, severe complications for people who already had diabetic fat put ulcer. So it's it's a vicious cycle there. On uh, on our end, uh, just briefly on this because I think both Rich and Radika have already summarized a lot. Rich kind of uh, summarized almost our entire experience as well. We actually published ours uh, in a, a couple of few different places. Uh, but uh, most notably in uh, diabetes care, I think a year or two ago, uh, uh, we called it a tale of two cities where we published our outcomes and outcomes from another unit that uh, has done a lot of work in limb preservation in, in um, Manchester. Um, and uh, uh, what we found was very similar between those two. But the, the big idea was actually, especially for our unit at first, we saw actually a dramatic, believe it or not, dramatic drop uh, in the first wave in amputations um, and, ho and, op and hospitalizations. I think it's just because so many people were staying out of hospital. But um, you, so you could talk about that or you can also attribute it because to these, these were captive. These were uh, several thousand patients that were our sort of captive patients within our group, um, uh, uh, within our large group. Um, and we were able to look after them amazingly I know this sounds crazy, but amazingly closely at home uh, by, by telehealth, by sending out people into the home, we were figuring out all kinds of things we had to do. We even published a paper where we did the first ever, where we couldn't bring a person with an EF of like 15 in the middle of freaking March of I think 2020 into the ED to debride a wound. That was a TMA that my Flomigo 
had just did a beautiful bypass on. We actually sent nurses who we trained to do maggot debridement, to do maggot debridement in the home. Uh, and that was the te by telehealth guidance using WhatsApp. And that was, uh, we think, the first telehealth guided a larval <laughs> maggot debridement thing in the literature. It was amazing. And this guy, I just saw him in clinic last week. He's walking and doing amazingly well. That was some baklava. But, but the point is that there's this top-down stuff and bottom-up. In the second wave, though, it was terrible. We had a, we had, because well, we started getting patients from outside of our kind of general ca catchment area, which is a large catchment area, but outside of it, kind of the network. And we had patients that had been waiting without any care. And those people came in and they were, we had one week where I think seven or eight or nine patients died just on our service alone. Yeah, okay. so, but, you know, to, to summarize what, what, what we all have said, it's yes, in reality. Now we have learned very important lessons and telehealth can be, in fact, successfully implemented for diabetic foot complication. And that actually, this brings into discussion another aspect that can be used to further, you know, implement the standard of care as even people who may not be always able to drive. Uh, for hours or longer distance. Now through this infrastructure that has been generated and it's available, they could in fact benefit of an expert care and then uh, you know triage them as well based on their individual risk and being provided with uh, care uh, through this virtual platform. Uh, and I, I think that that's another area that we could uh, further, uh, you know, work and educate and and make people aware of all these resources and just to follow up on this as a coda here um one of the other great things that has come out of all of this terrible uh in this uh, annus horribilis times three has been um uh, a program now in our in our county hospital uh that is a takeoff on what we call safer at home um and um, um and Brad Spellberg, who's our CMO at our LHC USC hospital, is an ID doctor, uh, uh, kind of tasked Chris Lynch, Christopher Lynch, who's a, another great physician who is now actively treating people almost entirely out of the hospital in the home with problems that we would have normally treated only in the hospital, people with uh, diabetic foot infections and even uh, you know bone infections, osteomyelitis, and now wound care is happening in the home um, in cases where there was 100% of the time we would have these people at least in hospital a little bit, but there are real advances happening now from all of this terrible stuff and things that we would thought we would have never done in the past are now actually happening. And it's really, really exciting. And then Lisa, just to put the icing on the cake, we're, there's the, the, the technology with remote monitoring is exploding. So we are trialing right now a device, it's the size of a Band-Aid. I put it over your radial artery. I can check your blood pressure, your heart rate, your potassium, your glucose, your hemoglobin. Now, this has not been rolled out yet. We're still doing a, a trial on it, but it can be sent to the doctor's computer. So just there's a remote technology that it's going to be coming in the near future is going to be unbelievable. And that will just accentuate the comments you've heard from from uh, from David and Rodica. Just I mean, the remote technology just boggles me. I'm just starting to dip my toe into that world. No pun intended. Sorry, David. And uh, and uh, it's really it's really going to be amazing what's coming down the pipe. So I think yeah. it's really going to be just the icing on the cake. Thank you for making that, particularly for people with diabetes, in which already yes. the technology use um, and implementation in their care uh, has quite some uh, history, you know, just yes. starting with. Uh, meters now, but now continuous glucose monitoring devices yes. and semi-automatic insulin delivery devices, among others. But you are absolutely right. The technology to remotely monitor at risk Blue. fit is now at a premium and we can even more implement it um, in the care. And by the way, Rich, I think did some of the first uh, human, inhuman, uh, not yep. inhuman, but in human studies of uh, something called GraphWorks, which was yep. the coolest uh, uh, device, which is a PTFE short segment kind of conduit, which has a, which will look for uh, 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 stenosis by. Yeah, but, that's another one. Yeah. Well, on that note, 
you know, we now have, because of this pandemic, or although we started getting the funding before, a program now, and I know you know about this, Rudy, because I'm trying to get your university involved, is called the National Science Foundation's Center to Stream Healthcare in Place, or C2 SHIP. Uh, and this, 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 this center, this is a five-university uh, uh, consortium. Uh, I'm the PI at, at, at Keck. Uh, like usual, the freaking least qualified but who's, you know, but all evidence would support that already. Uh, but the goal of this is to make more hospital free activity, rich days and generate new novel intellectual property. And we are working with everything from people who are doing spray on and spray on skin to 3d printed, uh, dressings to wearable robots, to cool new, you know, next gen wearables and watches. It's just the most, ex uh, to implantable sensors, just like you said, epidermal electronics. The time is, it's such an exciting time, even though there's so much bad going on. There's just well, so and, and, and they, the hospitals are going to push that. Because again, putting my chairman of surgery hat on, hospitals are going to turn into big ICUs and operators. We can't get access to our hospital is bursting at the seams. We've got to this take is, our, yeah. these kind of patients, our patients who, who wrote a can treat in her system at home with telehealth and remote monitoring and visits as needed. That's the future. And we got to yes. do it soon. <laughs> yes. You know, I just, I saw a, a question here in the chat and I just want to very quickly answer regarding one of our young um, uh, investigators who are, is apparently listening to the chat regarding some uh, research funding for new biomarkers that would, um, you know, help in healing. And again, I would like to highlight that it's, it's exactly what we are doing in the Diabetic Food Consortium. Uh, one of the main goals, besides now understanding why the standards of care are not implementing, it's to try to identify and validate viable biomarkers that can be used at the point of care, in other words, at the clinic, uh, to tell us more who is more likely to heal and who is more likely not to heal. We have already obtained a, a large body of biosamples that would be available as a resource for the community who is interested in, in that resource uh, with new ideas. And we will continue to get biosamples, including uh, obviously ulcer material, uh, debridement, uh, scrappings, dressing, but also blood and urine. And so, and there are a lot of grant pathways for the young people. Um, you know, if you are an early career investigator, the American Diabetes Association is committed to research funding. And we uh, have just this year increased again our research funding at the pre-pandemic level. So there are opportunities to apply for grants there, as well as through NIDDK, uh, leveraging the resources that we have in the food consortiums. I just want to make everybody aware uh, that we try to work together as much as possible, both on the clinical care, but also to advance the science and the research that then we can even more effectively apply to help these patients. I see someone talking about this potentially reducing the carbon footprint uh, uh, by reducing complications as well. Great. Uh, yeah, uh, great. Point. Point. Victor yeah. Zhao uh, was just, he, he's the current president of the National Academies. He was just out at our place giving a talk. And his entire talk was, believe it or not, on that. Uh, um, and uh, about how medicine and surgery now can be at the forefront there. It's pretty awesome. Well, this hour is going to just completely fly by. And, you know, I'm just so many excellent discussions and questions that are coming in that are energizing. I think one of the things that the American Diabetes Association is super excited about is just the energy that's that's coming into um, to focus on the in the alliance and, and to, to really make a, a, an impactful change in um, the rates of amputations in the lives of people with diabetes. Uh, you know, we talk with patients a lot. We've done some focus grouping. We've um, talked to them about their perceptions about amputations. And sometimes we hear from patients that they feel like it's a fait accompli. It's happened to their grandmother. It's happened to their uncle. They expect that it's going to happen um, to them. Other people feel as though it's they're completely not at risk. And those two two ends of the spectrum um, is something that we need to overcome. You know, just in thinking in the last kind, kind of minutes that we have here, what is the most important message for people with diabetes 
to take hold of and how can physicians and their healthcare teams help them actually have a realistic perspective perspective about what the risk is for them and how and what they need to do to empower um, themselves to to get the best care that they can get um I can start. Um, as a clinician, um, I have spent my entire career um, to take care of people with diabetes. I made, um, you know, um, a commitment in medical school uh, when I saw the devastating complication, among which actually the food complications were really at the very top that I want to make a difference in their life. And I continue that through my research. I like to say that it's very important to also make sure that we know how to talk to our patients. Um, uh, you know, just um, warning them about the dire consequences of diabetes may not be necessarily the right approach. Every patient is different. Um, and that is so important for us provider to take the time to listen to each of our patients and critically, you know, um, evaluate what are their specific, um, um, you know, conditions. And then we will be in a position to advise them, provide them with the information that they need for their particular case to make sure that we protect them for these uh, dire consequences. Um, it's also important that we speak the language that our patients will understand and explain why a certain recommendation is being made, not just because I am the doctor and I say so. So I, I think that that's also very, very important how we communicate and most importantly, how we listen to our patients. Each patient has a different perspective and we need to be aware of their perspective. I've learned from my patients every day when I see them and I think that that, that is probably the best way to, to make sure because they are the most important uh, partner in this team. The patient is at the center. They need to be part, active part of their team if you want to be successful. And um, that, that's my, uh, my my message. Yeah, and, I, and Lisa, I just would say, well, I just would build on that and just, just emphasize the fact that, you know, awareness is key. And to let people know that we've come a long way. We have amazing tools now. It's not a fait accompli that you're gonna have an amputation. And I would argue that most diabetics are at least somewhat at increased risk. And you know, it's, it, I, I mean, I hate going to the dentist, but now the dentist, I don't even feel anything anymore. And he fixes everything. We have minimally invasive techniques, both bypass and angioplasty and great wound care. We have come a long way with those technologies. People should not be afraid to get treated. I have some people, oh, well, you know what? I was afraid to come in because it's gonna be so painful. I'm gonna lose my leg. You know, we have great new techniques that we have to tell people about. So it's not a fait accompli. We can do this. Um, so just please seek the care because the alternative is is not as good. And, and finally, you know, I guess the big question then is how do you make a person do what they think they should already be doing and maybe what you do as well? Or how do you how, 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 does he, how do you make that happen? And there's no great answer for this is just except to freaking be there. Yeah. And, you know, my pop, who was the smartest guy I ever knew, he was a foot doctor. My daughter's going to be a third generation toe doctor. But my dad used to tell me that, you know, and I thought this was a poster or something or other. I, I used to roll my eyes when I was a teenager when he said, he said, son, folks don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. Mm -hmm. And you can see Rodika, Rich, and a lot of people on this call care but um i just always tell and people know when you leave the room but you just have to if people understand that you want to do something with them yeah. and not to them oh, that's good. then then that that comes across really really well and every one of our patients gets that message but that's like a uh, everyone has their own every, every master uh clinician she or he has a a way of communicating that. And in this area where the, where the problems are frequently silent, that is the most important point to take home. Thank you so much. I mean, I, I don't know that we could close on a better note. I think we look forward with the Amputation Prevention Alliance to working with um, stakeholders, um, working with 
policymakers, working with patients to empower them to um, have the best care that they can. Um, thank you all for participating today. Uh, this webinar will be posted online for future um, your viewing and reference. Um, but again, thank you. And we look forward to um, a strong um, new year and, and you know, taking on some of the major challenges um, that, and taking advantage of the opportunities that we have to um, impact the trajectory of, of rising rates of amputation in the United States and beyond. Thank you very much. Happy holidays to all. Here's to that, you guys. Take care. Be well.